Thank you for joining me for some more Southwest Lost Tales. Please leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. Hit the notification icon for more videos. Relax and enjoy. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Southwest Desert. Today, we're diving into a tale that's as salty as it is sweet, the rise and fall of the Salt and Sea Salt Works. It's a story of entrepreneurial spirit, technological innovation, and the raw power of nature. So sit back, relax, and let's journey back to a time when white gold glittered in the California desert. It's 1855 and the California gold rush is still in full swing. While thousands of prospectors are panning for yellow nuggets in the streams and mountains, a group of visionary businessmen have their eyes set on a different kind of treasure, one that lies 265 feet below sea level in the scorching Salton Sink. Led by George W. Dubrow, these men founded the New Liverpool Manufacturing Company, later known as the New Liverpool Salt Company. Their goal? To harvest the vast salt deposits that stretched across nearly 1,000 acres of sun-baked desert. Little did they know that their enterprise would become one of the largest salt operations in the United States, only to vanish beneath the waves of an accidental sea half a century later. Let's fast forward to 1884, almost three decades after the company's founding. The scene that greets us is both awe-inspiring and punishing. As the July sun climbs over the horizon, its rays strike a landscape of dazzling white. The salt beds are so bright that most white men can't look at them without smoked glasses. But the local Native American workers, already accustomed to the harsh desert conditions, are unfazed. They trudge across the salt flats, ready for another day of backbreaking labor in temperatures that will soar to a blistering 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The salt harvested here isn't just any salt. Tests have shown it to be between 94.68 and 97.76% pure sodium chloride. This exceptional purity means that the new Liverpool Salt Company doesn't need the usual refining machinery found in other salt works. Their operation is surprisingly simple, yet incredibly effective. At the heart of their harvesting process are large four-wheeled plows. Picture this. A Native American worker sits at the center of the plow, guiding it across the salt bed. But here's the clever part. The plow isn't pulled by horses or mules. Instead, it's attached to dummy engines on either side of the salt bed. These engines work in tandem to pull the plow back and forth, creating furrows about eight feet wide and six inches deep. It's an impressive sight with each plow capable of harvesting over 700 tons of salt per day. Once the salt is broken up by the plow, it's piled into small mounds around the drying shed. From there, it makes its final journey to the main mill. Inside the mill, the salt is hoisted to the upper floor and fed into a bulkhead breaker. This machine reduces the salt to uniform particles, which are then further ground down in a burr mill. The final stop is the bagging tables, where the salt is packaged and made ready for shipment to market. Now, you might be wondering, wouldn't they eventually run out of salt? Well, that's where the magic of the salt and sink comes in. Every single day, underground water would seep up through the soil. As it evaporated in the intense desert heat, it would leave behind a fresh crust of almost pure sodium chloride, ranging from 10 to 20 inches thick. It was a natural salt factory, replenishing itself faster than the company could harvest it. In fact, during the entire lifespan of the salt industry in the sink, only about 10 acres of the vast 1,000-acre deposit had been plowed. The salt from the salt and sink found its way into various markets. The lowest grade was used for curing hides, while the highest quality made its way to drugstore shelves. At one point, when health enthusiasts were raving about the benefits of ocean bathing, large quantities were even sold as bath crystals. The price varied from $6 to $34 per ton, depending on the quality, a tidy sum in those days. 
But here's where our story takes an interesting turn. For nearly half a century, the new Liverpool Salt Company had been operating on this land without actually owning it. The title to the land was still vested in the United States government, a fact that didn't go unnoticed by their competitors. Enter the Standard Salt Company. In 1901, they brought this legal oversight to the attention of government officials. The new Liverpool company was ordered to vacate the deposit they had worked for decades, but they weren't about to give up without a fight. In a move that would make modern lobbyists proud, the new Liverpool company reached out to Senator William M. Stewart of Nevada. On January 22, 1901, Senator Stewart introduced an act extending the mining laws to saline lands to the Senate. The bill passed and was sent to the president for signature. What happened next was like something out of a Wild West novel. Both the new Liverpool Company and the Standard Company had stationed agents in Washington, D.C. and in the desert town of Mecca, the closest telegraph to the salt fields. They were poised for a race. As soon as word came that the president had signed the bill, each company wanted to be the first to file a claim on the choicest sections of the salt beds. The Standard Company had hired a team of horses and a buggy for their dash to the salt flats. The new Liverpool Company, in a risky move, decided to use an old railroad pump car on the spur track leading to the field. The message flashed over the wire. The bill was signed. The new Liverpool man ran to his team on the hand car but the Standard Salt Company had an ace up their sleeve. They had secretly stationed a man on top of the telegraph office. As soon as he got the signal, he jumped up and, in full view of everyone, flashed a prearranged set of signals to another agent waiting at the salt deposits 12 miles away. In the end, a compromise was reached, and both companies were given equal footing in the salt business. In fact, by 1900, it seems the two companies had merged, with James S. Henton listed as the manager for both in the Los Angeles directory. Now, you might be thinking this is where our salt saga ends, with two competing companies joining forces to build a salt empire in the desert. But nature had other plans, and the next chapter of our story is one of destruction on a massive scale. In an attempt to control the mighty Colorado River for irrigation purposes, engineers from the California Development Company made a fateful decision. They diverted the entire volume of the river inland towards the Salton Sink. What happened next was nothing short of catastrophic. Millions of gallons of water poured into the Great Depression, forming what we now know as the Salton Sea. The salt companies watched helplessly, as their precious salt beds disappeared beneath the rising waters. The Southern Pacific Railroad, which had laid tracks through the area, saw miles of its main line submerged. The railroad company would go on to spend over $2 million, an astronomical sum at the time, in repeated attempts to close the breach. They tied up more than 1,200 miles of main line track in these efforts, but the river proved to be a formidable opponent. As you might expect, lawsuits soon followed. The salt companies filed suit against the California Development Company in the Superior Court of Riverside County, asking for $200,000 in damages and an injunction to stop more water from flowing into the sink. But as the flooding continued, so did the damage. By January 1906, the salt companies had to file a supplementary bill asking for an additional $210,000, $180,000 for the beds, and $30,000 for their plant. By December 19, 1907, it was all over. The salt beds and plants were completely submerged. In a final amendment to their lawsuit, the salt companies raised their claim to a total of $600,000. The legal battle dragged on for years, moving from the Southern District Court to the United States Circuit Court of Appeals. In August 1909, Judge Morrow affirmed the lower court's decision, 
awarding the salt companies $456,746.23 in damages, plus $1,500 in costs. At last, the salt companies had their victory, but it was a bittersweet one. Their industry was gone, swallowed by the new Salton Sea. Today, as travelers pass by the Salton Sea, few realize the history that lies beneath its waves. Where once there was a vast expanse of glittering salt, later became beach resorts, speedboats, and thousands of migratory birds. The U.S. Navy used a large portion of the sea for experimental purposes. But now that is also lost due to high salinity, contamination from irrigation runoff, a closed drainage basin, and toxic dust. But if you look closely, you might just catch a glimpse of the past. Beneath the surface lies a submerged town, the remains of the Southern Pacific Railroad's main line, and the ghosts of the new Liverpool and Standard Salt Companies. The story of the Salton Sea Salt Works is more than just a tale of a lost industry. It's a reminder of the ingenuity of early American entrepreneurs, the harsh realities of desert life, and the unstoppable power of nature. It's a story of triumph and tragedy, of man's attempt to harness the desert's resources and the desert's ultimate victory. The Salton Sea Salt Works may be gone, but their story lives on a testament to the ever-changing face of the American West and the enduring spirit of those who sought to tame it. Join us next time as we uncover more hidden stories from the Southwest frontier. Until then, keep exploring and remember, history is all around us, sometimes hidden just beneath the surface. Welcome to another journey into the history of the Southwest desert. We will be delving into the story of the Salton Sea at the turn of the 20th century. In this intriguing telling, we will learn its modern beginnings. This lake anomaly is 35 miles long by 15 miles wide and is located in the Southern California Imperial and Riverside Counties Desert. If you enjoy this episode, leave a like and comment. Please hit the subscribe button. It was the summer of 1891 when newspapers across America bore shocking headlines. A massive lake was suddenly appearing in California's Colorado Desert, one of the driest spots in the country. This sparsely populated region averages a mere three inches of rain per year. Yet somehow, a huge body of water was materializing. Where could all this water be coming from? How was a lake spontaneously forming in such an arid landscape? These questions gripped the public imagination, sparking intense speculation. Some theorized underground springs or aquifers had mysteriously surfaced. Others posited the lake was runoff from the distant Great Salt Lake in Utah. But with no concrete explanations, the lake's origins remained veiled in mystery. The newspaper editor in San Francisco tasked reporter Harry Patton with investigating. Patton wasted no time, traveling into the desert interior to lay eyes on the phenomenon himself. Reaching the location where the lake was said to be appearing, the Salton Sink, Patton found visible evidence seeming to confirm the rumors. Whereas the sink had always harbored a small salt marsh nourished by a trickle of brine, now a substantial lake occupied the depression, filled with salt water. Patton swiftly filed his initial report for the paper. Yet Patton knew his investigation was just beginning. He had to discover the source feeding this desert sea if the mystery was to be solved once and for all. Locating a nearby tributary of the Colorado River, Patton hired a boatman named Converse. Together, they sailed downstream, tracing the water's course. Days later, they arrived at a breached section of the river's west bank just south of the Mexico border near Yuma. Rivers of water gushed out of the rupture, inundating the parched landscape. Venturing through the broken levee, Patton and Converse found themselves borne along violent new channels cutting through the desert. Newly eroded cliffs towered around them as their tiny crafts shot through whitewater rapids. After several days navigating this ad hoc river system, they emerged onto the surface of a sprawling lake, 
the very same lake Patton had discovered days earlier in the Salton Sink. By boat, Patton had managed to follow the Colorado River's escaping flows as they flooded into the sink depression. The source of the mysterious lake was now clear, a river unleashed from its restraints. Patton relayed his harrowing discoveries in a series of dispatches back to his paper, but many readers across California remained unconvinced. The full story of how this could happen, involving the Colorado's long history of unstable courses across the Delta landscape, was not yet widely appreciated, and so Patton's exploits were considered far-fetched, if not outright fabrications. Among the doubting readers was a San Francisco man named Captain Thomas Fraser. Fraser knew the Colorado River Delta well from past surveying expeditions in the region. He understood how the Colorado often shifted back and forth between disparate outlets, either the Gulf of California to the south or the parched Salton Sink Basin to the north. This unstable regime was due to the river overflowing a modest silt barrier separating the upper and lower delta. But when Fraser had last viewed the area, the river was in one of its gulf-spilling phases, keeping the Salton Sink dry. Could the wild vagaries of this river have now caused it to flood north into this desert depression once more? Fraser realized that extreme seasonal flooding could potentially produce this outcome, but another possibility also nagged him. Years before, Fraser had witnessed tremendous tidal bores propagating through the delta each day, extending inland many miles toward the Salton Sink. He harbored an alternative theory— could ocean tides be the driving force pushing water to fill this sink? Though lacking concrete evidence, Fraser felt compelled to directly investigate both hypotheses on site. Enlisting his associate Walter Hathaway, Fraser embarked by train to the desert outpost of Indio, California in the withering summer heat. Temperatures crackled above 100 degrees Fahrenheit day and night. Pushing west of Indio, the pair soon reached the Salton Sink's edge. Gazing down onto its surface, they were stunned to find the expansive lake now actively encroaching upon structures built along its shoreline. Finding a flat-bottomed boat, Fraser and Hathaway set sail onto the lake that same evening under starry skies. All through the night and into the next sweltering day, they slowly rowed north. Ultimately, they reached the lake's southern margins, observing muddy inflows that appeared to originate from nearby desert washes. Wading ashore through blistering muck, Hathaway attempted to ascertain whether the entering waters were saline, hinting at tidal origin or fresh, suggesting direct linkage to the errant Colorado. But the sludgy terrain defeated inspection by foot. Retreating back aboard, the men continued eastward by boat. Mile after mile, they rode beneath the pounding sun. Eventually, channels of faster-flowing water came into view, evidence of the escaped Colorado. Tasting the liquid in these channels, the men confirmed beyond doubt that it was fresh water, thoroughly disproving Fraser's speculative tide theory. Though disappointed to have his hypothesis sunk, Fraser gained key insights about the region's hydrology from his pioneering lake voyage. With proof now established that the expanding lake owed solely to Colorado River flooding, the true chain of events could be unraveled. As suddenly as it had arrived that summer, the Salton Sea soon evaporated once more by 1900 as the Colorado shifted course again. But the wayward Colorado wasn't yet finished flexing its muscle in that arid valley. In 1905, catastrophic flooding burst from irrigation canals under construction in the region. Unchecked torrents of Colorado water again inundated the Salton Sink, birthing a new Salton Sea to replace the long-forgotten lake of 1891. The renegade river's days of random rampages in the Imperial Valley were ultimately numbered, however. In the 1930s, the Great Hoover Dam rose up the canyon country, at last penning the unruly Colorado. 
this immense flood control barrier would regulate its flows, signaling the end of its unpredictable desert deluges as Fraser had witnessed decades before. Yet while engineered works might restrain it, the latent Colorado forever holds potential for provoking geographical chaos. As Captain Fraser and Harry Patton explored firsthand, man's domain remains acutely fragile against nature's whims in the hot, arid West. Their exploits navigating the desert's wayward waters shine light on this fine line separating fragile civilization from flooding desolation. Even with mighty dams holding back chaos, the slumbering forces they contain must never be forgotten if the reclaimed land is to remain reclaimed. The journey through Southern California's arid expanse reveals the delicate balance between human endeavor and nature's fickle temperament, a tale as wild as the Colorado itself. Thank you for joining me on this adventure through the Southern California desert. Welcome, listeners, to today's episode where we'll dive into a fascinating chapter of Southwest desert history that combines scientific exploration, ambitious dreams, and heated controversy. Our story takes us back to the late 19th century, to the scorching expanse of the Colorado desert, where one man's observation sparked a nationwide debate about transforming an arid wasteland into a vast inland sea. Our tale begins with Dr. J.P. Whitney, a U.S. Army surgeon who found himself traversing the harsh landscape of the Colorado desert. As he rode his horse through this unforgiving terrain, Little did he know that his observations would soon capture the imagination of a nation and earn this desolate basin the moniker of the Whitney Sea. In January 1873, Dr. Whitney published an article in the Overland Monthly describing a peculiar sight that caught his eye during his desert expeditions. He noticed a consistent, well-defined line along the mountainsides, reminiscent of an ancient shoreline. Upon closer inspection, he found evidence that supported his theory of a long-lost sea in this now-parched land. Whitney's keen eye observed rocks worn smooth up to a certain level, as if by the constant washing of water. He noted coarse coral formations in the crevices and on the sides of these rocks. Above this line, the rocks remained sharp and jagged, untouched by the hypothetical waters of this ancient sea. But it wasn't just the rocks that piqued Whitney's interest. Along what he believed to be the former shoreline, he discovered countless seashells. Some were minute, others fragile, resembling the kind one might find in sheltered arms of the sea. He was particularly struck by delicate bivalves, about an inch wide and an inch and a half long, with shells barely thicker than a few sheets of paper. As a man of medicine, Dr. Whitney was accustomed to reasoning from effect to cause. Holding these fragile shell fragments in his hands, he couldn't help but ponder their origin and survival. How could these delicate remnants withstand the constant battering of wind and sand? He estimated that they could not have endured for more than a few centuries at most. This observation led Whitney to a startling conclusion. He was standing on the bed of a relatively recently vanished sea. He envisioned a time when the land bloomed and flourished, a stark contrast to the current landscape where lone whirlwinds raised columns of sand hundreds of feet into the air. After multiple explorations of this thermal waste, as he called it, Whitney developed a theory about the formation and disappearance of this inland sea. He proposed that the Colorado River, which empties into the Gulf of California, had spent centuries depositing the red mud from Arizona's northern plateaus at its mouth. Over time, this process created a massive delta that eventually cut off the desert basin from the Gulf. Once isolated, the trapped water slowly evaporated, leaving behind the scorched landscape Whitney observed. But Dr. Whitney wasn't content with merely theorizing about the past. He saw an opportunity to reshape the future of the American Southwest. Upon returning to Los Angeles, he began to expound his theories to the public, 
arguing that the drying up of this inland sea had caused significant climatic changes in the surrounding regions. Whitney's proposal was bold and visionary, restore the ancient sea. He contended that by bringing back this massive body of water, beneficial climatic conditions would return to the stricken areas. Even California, already blessed with a favorable climate, would see positive effects. Rainfall, he argued, would increase substantially. To support his claims, Whitney provided some striking calculations. He estimated that evaporation from this restored sea would be enough to supply 12 inches of rain to an area more than double the size of Ohio, if all the moisture were to be recondensed and precipitated. As one might expect, Whitney's proposal was met with immediate skepticism and criticism. Critics scoffed at the idea of humans making a sea, some even calling it blasphemous. But Whitney had an answer ready, divert the Colorado River into the basin. He acknowledged that the flow of the Colorado might not be sufficient to fill the entire basin, but argued that even partially filling the northern portion would help mitigate the desiccating winds born in this desert furnace. The local press quickly latched onto the story, sensing its news value. The Los Angeles Star trumpeted Whitney's ideas, calling for Congress to appoint a scientific commission to study the practicality, cost, and potential effects of the project. The newspaper praised Whitney's views as sound in every particular and urged California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah delegations in Congress to demand government action. As news of Whitney's proposal spread, it captured the public imagination. The Whitney Sea became a hot topic of conversation across the nation, discussed in parlors, barber shops, and bars. The scientific community took notice as well, with at least one college conferring a master's degree on Dr. Whitney for his contribution to science in the nation. Learned debates erupted among savants, arguing the merits and potential pitfalls of the plan. Some enthusiastic supporters advocated for the immediate formation of a company to begin digging a canal from the Colorado River to the basin, eager to start filling this natural bathtub without delay. Others pushed for cartographic changes, insisting that all maps should be updated to reflect the future Whitney Sea rather than the outdated Colorado Desert. But not everyone was convinced. Skeptics raised concerns about potential negative consequences. Some worried that increased moisture in the air would lead to a rise in malaria cases. Others speculated about the effects on local flora and fauna, conjuring images of orange trees growing to the height of sequoias and bearing pumpkin-sized fruit, or harmless garter snakes evolving into menacing boa constrictors. The controversy surrounding the Whitney Sea proposal soon caught the attention of political figures, none other than General John C. Fremont, then serving as the governor of Arizona Territory, took an interest in the matter. Known as the Pathfinder for his earlier explorations of the American West, Fremont saw potential in the idea and decided to bring it to the attention of the federal government. Fremont embarked on a journey to Washington, D.C. to present the subject to his superiors. His involvement lent credibility to Whitney's proposal and elevated the discussion to a national level. The prospect of transforming a vast desert into a productive region captured the imagination of many politicians who saw it as a way to expand America's agricultural and economic frontiers. While the debate raged on, fueled by a mix of scientific speculation, economic ambition, and pure fantasy, one crucial aspect had been overlooked, the mathematical feasibility of the project. It took General George Stoneman, a practical-minded resident of Los Angeles, to bring some much-needed perspective to the discussion. Addressing a shocked audience in Los Angeles, Stoneman laid out the stark realities of the proposed project. He started by outlining the dimensions of the basin, as described by proponents of the Whitney Sea, 300 miles long, 50 miles wide, 
and 300 feet deep, roughly the size of Lake Erie. Then, Stoneman dropped his bombshell. To fill such a basin in just one year, assuming a watertight bottom and no evaporation, would require a stream 20 miles wide, 20 feet deep, with a current of 3 miles an hour. Put another way, using a more realistic stream size of 1,000 feet wide, 10 feet deep and running at 3 miles an hour, it would take 200 years to fill the basin. But the general wasn't done yet. He pointed out that even after filling this massive lake, it would require a constant inflow of water to compensate for evaporation. His calculations showed that a river about the size of the Colorado at ordinary stages, 250 feet wide, 10 feet deep, and flowing at 5 miles per hour, would be needed just to offset the estimated 18 inches of yearly evaporation. Stoneman's mathematical analysis effectively burst the bubble of the Whitney Sea dream. He humorously compared Whitney's proposal to Archimedes's famous claim about moving the world with a lever and fulcrum, suggesting that Whitney believed he could create a sea if only given enough greenbacks or government funding. The general concluded his reality check with a poignant observation. He suggested that, long before any human effort could fill the basin with water, the great engineer of the universe, nature itself, would have filled it with the sands of the desert, driven by the prevailing northern winds. While some might quibble with the precise accuracy of Stoneman's calculations, his intervention was sufficient to dampen the enthusiasm for the sea-building project. The hard numbers he presented made it clear that the Whitney Sea, however appealing in theory, was simply not feasible in practice. Although the grand vision of the Whitney Sea never materialized, the story didn't end there. In the years that followed, the Colorado Desert did see significant changes, though not in the form of a vast inland sea. Irrigation projects gradually brought water to parts of the vast wasteland. Farms and ranches began to dot the desert floor, transforming areas that were once thought uninhabitable. Cities like Coachella, Indio, Brawley, El Centro, and Calexico sprouted up, bringing the touch of human civilization to a land that Dr. Whitney had described as filled with only the glare of the never-ending sand and the silence of death. Looking back on the Whitney Sea controversy, we can see it as a fascinating chapter in the history of the American West. It represents a unique intersection of scientific observation, ambitious engineering, environmental speculation, and public imagination. Dr. Whitney's proposal, while ultimately impractical, speaks to the spirit of his time, an era when the vast expanses of the American West seemed to invite grand schemes and transformative projects. It was a period when the power of human engineering was beginning to reshape landscapes on an unprecedented scale, and the idea of creating an inland sea didn't seem entirely outlandish. The story also highlights the importance of rigorous scientific and mathematical analysis in evaluating such grand proposals. General Stoneman's intervention serves as a reminder of the value of clear-headed, quantitative thinking in the face of exciting but potentially unrealistic ideas. Moreover, the Whitney Sea controversy foreshadowed many of the environmental and engineering debates that would come to characterize the 20th and 21st centuries. Questions about the wisdom and feasibility of large-scale environmental modification, the potential unintended consequences of such projects, and the balance between human ambition and natural limitations continue to be relevant today. Today, if you were to visit the site where Dr. Whitney once sat atop his horse, scanning the red rock cliffs, you would find that, in many ways, the silence of the desert still reigns. The vast inland sea he envisioned never came to be, and it's unlikely that the silence will ever be broken by the wash of waves on a shoreline. Thank you for joining us on this journey through a fascinating chapter of American Southwest history. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning,
and never stop dreaming big, but always remember to check your math. Welcome to the Southwest Desert Channel, where we bring you stories of the rugged individuals who shape the Southwest frontier. Today, we're diving into the life of Frank Coffey, one of the last great prospectors of the Southern California desert. Get ready for a tale of adventure, perseverance, and endless storytelling. It's the early 1900s, and the vast deserts of Southern California are still largely unexplored. Amidst the harsh landscape of sand and rock, a lone figure trudges along, leading a small group of burrows. This is Frank Coffey, a man who would become known as the Mayor of Dos Palmas and one of the desert's most colorful characters. Frank Coffey wasn't your typical prospector. A graduate mining engineer, he had a formal education that set him apart from many of his peers. But it wasn't his technical knowledge that made him a legend in these parts. No, it was his unparalleled ability to spin a yarn that would keep listeners captivated for hours on end. Imagine sitting around a campfire under the star-filled desert sky, the flames flickering as Frank Coffey's rich voice weaves a tale that seems to have no end. That was the experience many had when they encountered this self-proclaimed man of few words. Frank's story began in the 1880s when he first started prospecting in the Colorado and Mojave deserts. For decades, he roamed the harsh landscape, always in search of that elusive big strike. But unlike many prospectors who were driven by dreams of wealth, Frank seemed content with the journey itself. In 1906, Frank's engineering background came in handy when he worked with the Southern Pacific Railroad. At the time, they were racing against nature, trying to keep their tracks above the rising waters of the Salton Sea. This flood, caused by a breach in the Colorado River, was threatening to swallow up miles of vital railway. Frank's expertise helped the railroad stay one step ahead of the encroaching water. But it was in the rugged canyons of the Chocolate and Chuckawalla Mountains where Frank truly felt at home. With his trusted burrows by his side, he explored every nook and cranny of this unforgiving terrain. These animals weren't just beasts of burden to Frank. They were his companions, his confidants, and often his only audience. Frank's love for his burrows was legendary. He treated them more like family than livestock. In fact, one of his closest friends was another prospector named Gus Lederer, known as the Mayor of Corn Springs. These two desert rats had a unique tradition. Once a year, they would visit each other, but not alone. No. They brought their entire herds of burrows along for the journey. It was a sight to behold. Two weathered prospectors leading a parade of donkeys across the desert landscape. Now, let's talk about Frank's culinary skills, or lack thereof. His signature dish was something he proudly called coffee's leatheries. These were flapjacks so dense and chewy that only a burrow could truly appreciate them. Every Sunday morning, Frank would whip up a batch big enough to last the week, sharing them with his four-legged friends. It was a testament to the hardiness of desert life that anyone, man or beast, could survive on such fare. But Frank's generosity didn't stop at feeding his burrows. He was known for his hospitality, always ready to share a meal with travelers, even if that meal was of questionable quality. His coffee was infamous, brewed from the salty, alkaline water of Dos Palmas Spring and often made with grounds that had been reused for days. And don't get us started on his beans, seasoned with so much chili they lit fire to the stomach. Frank's cabin at Dos Palmas was a sight to behold. His unique approach to housekeeping involved layering newspapers on his table, adding a fresh one each week until the stack was thick enough to serve as impromptu placemats. Dishes? Well, those were simply tossed into a tub of warm spring water to soak, sometimes for weeks on end. But what Frank lacked in culinary and cleaning skills, he more than made up for with his storytelling. People would travel for miles just to hear him spin a tale. 
One listener reported that Frank once started a story at 10 in the morning and continued, almost without interruption, until midnight. And even then, he wasn't finished. He picked up right where he left off at daybreak the next morning. Frank's stories were as vast and winding as the desert canyons he explored. They could meander for hours, taking unexpected turns and detours, much like his prospecting expeditions. And just when you thought you'd reached the end, Frank would find a new vein to follow, leading his captive audience deeper into the tale. But life wasn't always easy for Frank. Despite his years of prospecting, he never struck it rich. He lived on the edge of poverty, often relying on the kindness of strangers or the occasional grub stake from an unsuspecting tenderfoot. But even in lean times, Frank's spirit remained unbroken. He had a knack for turning his misfortunes into entertaining anecdotes, ensuring that he rarely went hungry as long as there were new ears to hear his stories. One of Frank's clever schemes involved inviting newcomers to see his famous needle, a spectacular clay and conglomerate formation in a nearby canyon. He'd time these expeditions to span the lunch hour, ensuring a free meal and often some leftover supplies. It was a testament to Frank's charm that his victims rarely minded being taken advantage of in this way. The price of a meal seemed small in exchange for the entertainment Frank provided. Frank's presence in the desert wasn't just about survival or the search for gold. He had a deep appreciation for the harsh beauty of his surroundings and a sense of responsibility to his fellow desert travelers. Along his regular routes, he'd leave handwritten signs inviting strangers to share a meal or make use of his campsites. These messages, written in his surprisingly elegant handwriting, were like breadcrumbs of hospitality scattered across the barren landscape. One touching example of Frank's hidden depths was his treatment of a small, unmarked grave near Das Palmas Spring. The story goes that a family of travelers had lost their baby while camping at the spring. They buried the child in a shallow grave and moved on, leaving no marker. This didn't sit right with Frank. He traveled 50 miles to the Coxcomb Mountains, found a suitable piece of soapstone, and carried it back by burrow. He then carved an inscription for Poor Baby White and placed it at the grave. For years afterward, Frank made sure fresh flowers were placed on the tiny grave, a poignant gesture from a man who presented himself as a rough, carefree prospector. Frank's life wasn't all tall tales and pancakes, though. He had a strong sense of justice, as evidenced by his involvement in a dispute over water rights at Corn Springs. When a wealthy mine promoter tried to sue a widow for her water holdings, Frank stepped up to testify on her behalf. He was proud of standing up for the underdog, often declaring, Say, I'd sell a gold mine to a rich man, but I'd never sue a widow. It was a statement he'd repeat with increasing volume and enthusiasm. As the years went by, the desert began to take its toll on Frank. His body, weathered by decades of harsh living, began to fail him. His friends, concerned for his welfare, managed to get him to the Riverside County Hospital under the guise of a casual car ride. But for a free spirit like Frank, the confines of a hospital were unbearable. He was later moved to a nursing home, but even that was a poor substitute for the open desert he loved. In October 1936, at the age of 77, Frank Coffey passed away. He died as he had lived much of his life, alone but far from the desert he called home. But while Frank may have felt isolated in his final days, his legacy lived on in the memories of those who had known him and in the stories that continued to circulate long after he was gone. Today, Frank Coffey's name lives on in the very landscape he roamed for so many years. Coffey Spring, nestled in a gulch just north of the Salton Sea in the Chocolate Mountains, stands as a lasting tribute to this colorful character of the American West. As we reflect on the life of Frank Coffey, we're reminded of a time when the American West was still wild and untamed. Frank represented a breed of men and women 
who face the harsh realities of desert life with resilience, humor, and an unquenchable spirit of adventure. He may not have struck it rich in gold, but Frank Coffey's true wealth lay in the stories he told, the friendships he forged, and the indelible mark he left on the history of the Southern California desert. His life serves as a reminder that sometimes the journey itself, with all its hardships and joys, is the real treasure. This has been the Southwest Desert. Join us next time as we continue to explore the lives of the remarkable individuals who shaped the Southwest frontier. Until then, may your coffee be strong, your stories be long, and your spirit be as free as Frank Coffee's. I hope you enjoyed these Southwest adventures. If you would like to help support my channel and time hit the super thanks heart icon on the bottom of the video and contribute, this is very helpful. Happy trails.